Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Happy Douglas week. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hello. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy birthday, Frederick Douglas. We're just going to wait one minute to see that everyone can take a virtual seat, that you can all join us here. So happy Douglas week. Happy birthday, Frederick. Um, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. I see lots of people coming in, so that's great. Thank you for joining us today. I'll just give it a minute before we start so that everyone can get set up. And I'm here with my wonderful colleagues and friends and co-organizers, Kristen Leary and Sarah McCready. Happy Douglas Week, everyone. Okay, more people coming in. Fabulous, even more, that's great, super. Happy Douglas Week, everyone. All right, we'll give it a go because we wanna get to this wonderful talk. So I'm very excited about this. Um, some of you probably have seen all of our faces during this really amazing, inspirational um, week and um, uh, a very warm welcome to you guys, um, everyone out there joining in today. My name is Dr. Caroline Schroeder. I'm one of the co-organizers. I'm here with Sarah McCready and Kristen Leary today, uh, two of the wonderful co-organizers uh, of Douglas Week. And we're very, very grateful that you are here to join us to celebrate Frederick Douglass, especially on his birthday today, his chosen birthday. So happy birthday, Frederick Douglass. Uh, it's been an incredible week so far. We're uh, very, uh, very grateful and so inspired uh, by all the creative and very um, amazing events this week. And uh, before we get to the next one, uh, this one is promising to be uh, truly amazing as well. Um, I just wanted to uh, share a few items of housekeeping with you. Um, first of all, this um, event will be about one hour long. And if you have any questions, you'll see a little Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Um, you can pop in your question there whenever you're ready, whenever you're curious, be curious, you know, ask away. Um, we will monitor the, the, the Q&A box. Sarah, um, Kristen and myself will be passing on questions and comments to the speakers. And um, so we'll try and make sure that every, everything gets answered. Um, so if you have a question, put them in the Q&A box, please just be respectful to all panelists. Um, another item of housekeeping is just that this will be recorded. We're live on YouTube as well. So hello, everyone, uh, all the viewers on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. And now it is my great pleasure to hand over to the wonderful uh, Robert Manson. He's a Harvard graduate uh, and the Harvard Alumni Association Director for Europe and a member of the Harvard Alumni Anti-Racism Working Group. So, Bob, thank you so much for being here with us today. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Caroline. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. That's great. Well, let me uh, welcome everybody to our event today. Um, I know we have people joining us from across Ireland and around the world. So uh, let me start off by first wishing everybody a happy St. Valentine's Day. Um, and seeing as we have a lot of people here very interested in history, I thought I'd mention a matter of uh, historical fact that is not particularly widely known, uh, and that is that uh, St. Valentine, um, the remains of St. Valentine are actually buried in a crypt in a Carmelite church uh, on White Friar Street in Dublin city centre. So uh, some of you may, may not be aware of that fact. As Caroline mentioned, uh, Bob Manson is my name. I came to know um, Caroline through my membership of the Anti-Racism Working Group of the Harvard Alumni Association. Um, Douglas Week is obviously coming to a close today. It has been a phenomenal success and uh, lots of people uh, can take a lot of credit for that. I'd like to personally uh, mention, single out uh, Caroline, who, you know, the first time Caroline and I spoke, uh, we agreed that we'd get on a Zoom call for a couple of minutes and I think we ended up staying on for, you know, an hour and a half or something like that. Caroline, you're, th this is, uh, uh, you know, a great success and it owes its success in, in large measure to your energy, your enthusiasm, your dedication. So it's been an absolute pleasure uh, 
uh, working with you on on this um, on this project. Um, I know we can't unmute ourselves because we're in a webinar format, but I think if we could unmute ourselves, we'd hear a very large uh, round of applause and cheering for, for you and for everybody who's been involved in putting this together. So thank you for doing that. Our speaker today is celebrated Irish historian, author and travel writer, Turtle Bunbury. Uh, he's written extensively on a wide range of subjects through the lens of history. His contributions notably include Ireland's Forgotten Past, 1847, a chronicle of genius, generosity, and savagery. And a personal favorite of mine is the Vanishing Ireland series, co-authored with photographer James Fennell. The subject of his talk today is contextualizing Douglas's Ireland, the world in 1845 to 1847. So over the course of the next hour, Turtle is gonna set out significant happenings in various parts of the world at the time that Frederick Douglas, a former slave traveling as a free man, um, set first set foot in Ireland. So please um, uh, use the Q&A function, as Caroline mentioned, to um, ask any questions that you have, and we'll do that in the Q&A uh, session towards the end of the hour. Uh, please join me in welcoming Turtle Bunbury. Turtle? Uh, greetings, Bob. I think I'm, I'm now no longer on uh, mute. Um, thank you for those uh, lovely words and a very happy Valentine's Day to you too um, and uh, to all of you out there. It is a tremendous pleasure for uh, me to take part in um, Douglas Week. Uh, I've been a, a big fan of Frederick Douglass since I, uh, had, I wrote about him for a book a few years ago called 1847 and, and, and got, to, got to know him uh, reasonably well at that time. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, and, and greetings, by the way, from the wild and woolly uh, County Carlow uh, at the foot of the Wicklow Mountains, where it's pretty stormy today uh, down here. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, go to um, my uh, PowerPoint slideshow, um, which I will be uh, hopefully sharing with you now. Hang on. Ah, sorry, bear with me one second. Uh, from start. Okay. Three, two, one, here we go, right. Um, now, most of you who, who, are, who are watching by, would be fully aware who um, Frederick Douglass was, but I know some of you aren't uh, yet. Uh, so a very quick uh, backdrop of him. He was born into slavery, uh, as Bob said, onto a plantation in Talbot County uh, in Maryland. And Talbot County, uh, for uh, the record, was named for the Irish family of Talbot, uh, who were around Carton, uh, in Carton House in County Kildare, and later Malahide, so that's an interesting link there as well. Uh, he was born in 1817, 1818, on Valentine's Day, as Caroline said, it, 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 that's the date he adopted, he was never quite sure. Um, and his mum was a slave, and his father, again, nobody's quite sure, possibly the plantation owner. Uh, at the age of 20, he uh, escaped uh, very dramatically and, and uh, got to the northern states uh, where slavery was not uh, permitted, and he began to lecture widely uh, in those parts. And then in June, 1845, he published his ground-shaking autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. Um, and that book made him, well, it made him a marked man. Uh, and so fearful that he would be captured and brought back south by, uh, to the Southern States by bounty hunting um, slave catchers, he sailed to Britain. Uh, where slavery was uh, now illegal. And he went on a fundraising tour for the American Anti-Slavery Society. And this is what brought him to Ireland. Uh, and it was a, an astonishing and pretty happy, uh, relatively speaking, period of his life. Um, and that's what this fabulous Douglas Week has been about. Um, anyway, so what I want to do is I want to put some context uh, on what was going on around the world during the time that Douglas was here. Um, in Ireland during those last four months of 1845 and early 1846. And indeed, while, while he was touring uh, in Britain uh, through until the spring of 1847, when he set sail uh, head, heading back west. Um, so um, let's put some perspectives on it. It's not that long ago. Um, 1845, it is 175 years ago, uh, but it's only two 87 year olds ago and Michael Caine is 87. So it's only two Michael Caines ago. The point being when Michael Caine was a baby, 
if an 87 year old came up went hello little Michael little baby Michael that guy was born in 1845 put it another way uh, on Friday I spoke with a, a 92 year old uh, uh, man in Dublin uh, who knew his great grandmother when he was a kid and his great grandmother was alive when Frederick Douglass was in Ireland. Uh, she didn't meet him, uh, not, not that I know of, but uh, she, uh, there, there could easily be people alive today who met people who did see or even meet Frederick Douglass. It's, it's, it's slightly crazy like that. Okay, if we um, put a different context, when Douglass arrived um, in Ireland in 1845, that is 64 years after the American Revolution. OK, so you get any, that seems like a long time ago. But if we go back 64 years ago from today, we get to 1957. We get to Elvis Presley uh, on the rise, John Wayne rocking the box office. Suddenly it doesn't seem that long ago, right? Um, or try uh, Napoleon. Um, you know, he was defeated at uh, the Battle of Waterloo 30 years before Frederick Douglass arrived. Um, again, how do, we, how do we relate that in time? Well, that's like 1991 to us today. It's Kevin Costner as Robin Hood. It is Right Said Fred. It is Zig and Zag. Um, and sure, that only all feels like yesterday, uh, certainly to me. Uh, my point is that the past is always closer than you think. Okay. The population, look at all those people. It's so odd to see uh, so many people uh, together like that, isn't it? Well, in the 1840s, the world's population stood at about 1.25 billion, uh, as opposed to 7.7 .7 billion today. So less than a fifth uh, of what we have today. In Ireland, of course, the population uh, was uh, bigger than it is now. And I'll, I'll come back to the, to the great hunger, the, the great famine uh, later in this talk. Um, its impact was, of course, enormous. Um, and in terms of population, I, I, I can't think of any other country where the population today is, uh, you know, much smaller than it was back then. Um, let's look at a map of uh, Europe. I mean, Wikipedia, when I looked it up, it suggests that there were about 170 uh, sovereign states in the world during the 1840s. Uh, and another 10 that claim to be sovereign, so give or take a few because, you know, there's always a bit of uh, room for maneuver. It's not a lot different to today. There's uh, 195 ind independent sovereign states today. Um, but of course, the makeup of those states back in the 1840s was uh, dramatically different. Um, I don't know how closely you can see that map, but if you look at uh, Europe, you'll see that a lot of those 170 sovereign states were, well, a lot of them were in, in what would become the German Empire. And you see kingdoms and duchies and grand duchies and electorates and free cities like Hanover and Lübeck. But there are kingdoms and principalities all over Europe. You've got things like the Papal States down in Italy. Uh, then, of course, you've got these empires. There were empires, the Austrian Empire, the Russian Empire, the British Empire, um, which was expanding at all the times. I mean, the, the British had just moved down into New Zealand in, in 1840 and taken over New Zealand and were consolidating their hold in Australia and, of course, India. Uh, and you also have, well, this map is from 1815, so it's still called the Kingdom of France on it, but pushing on a little bit, it's the, the French Republic, um, but it's kind of like an empire at that stage and has imperial ambitions, as, I, again, I will come on to. Um, so, you know, that's what that's looking like, but around the world, there are, as I say, Russian empires, the Ottoman Empire, you can see in the, in the dominating the Middle East, the Qing Empire in China. Um, it's even in, in, in Africa as well, there are, there are plenty of empires down there, the Benin, the Bamana, the Kong, the Ethiopian kingdoms, kingdoms galore, uh, even uh, places like Fiji and Hawaii are kingdoms. Uh, Middle East also has sultanates and emirates uh, going on there. And there's even a few of these weird things called uh, republics like Chile and Ecuador and the United States where people have this strange and startling notion that people can rule without a monarchy. <laughs> anyway, people uh, were on the march at almost every latitude. The citizens of Europe were by and large moving, making a trek from the countryside to the cities 
uh, where the Industrial Re Revolution was powering onwards at this time. Uh, many more were making their uh, way to the distant continents of Australia, uh, Africa, and America to uh, start anew. Uh, and some are even venturing north to uh, the Arctic. Now, I'm going to uh, bring us uh, to Texas, because sometimes we forget how much people uh, moved in those times. And I wanted to start with a story that's set uh, about 1,500 miles southwest of the Maryland plantation where uh, Douglas uh, was born. Um, and on the 1st of May, 1845, uh, just before he published his, his narrative, in fact, a German aristocrat um, arrived in Galveston, Texas, uh, to take charge of a new uh, German colony in Texas. And his name was Baron uh, Ottfried Hans von Muisbach. Uh, but he actually ceased calling himself a baron uh, the moment he arrived in Texas, and he became plain old John Muisbach. Um, and he came from the Duchy of Nassau, which is this heavily forested region of West Germany. And he was part of a group of liberal German intellectuals that were seeking a new utopia in what was actually the, the very short-lived Republic of Texas. A couple of years earlier, uh, two very dodgy German speculators had managed to secure uh, almost 4 million acres of Texas. Uh, is this sort of coyote speckled savanna land and, and, and prairies. And it sold a chunk of this uh, land to Moisbach and uh, Moisbach's pals. Uh, and it became a, a colony uh, for a pretty curious mix of German emigrants. Um, they were uh, across between some impoverished workers and, and a lot of liberal, well-to-do middle classes who were basically on the run from uh, Germany because of the social, political, economic climates back there. And so they'd all uh, come, made their way to Texas. But by the time Moisbach arrived to join them and take charge of the whole thing, they'd worked out that they'd been kind of hoodwinked and that the land uh, that they'd been sold was deep in Comancheria. Um, that's the land of the Comanches. Um, and in fact, it was the traditional hunting grounds of the Penateca, who are the largest and arguably the fiercest of the Comanche Indian uh, bands that were roaming the Great Plains at that time. Um, and they were, uh, they were formidable warriors. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the Comanche. Uh, their superpower was their brilliant horsemanship. Um, so that uh, by the age of five, most of them could, could ride horses. By the time they were teenagers, they could shoot arrows with deadly precision. They could lasso a, a wild horse or scoop another man up onto their horse, all while thundering at a full gallop. Amazing warriors. Uh, they'd actually stopped the advance of the Spanish Empire, which had been you know, creeping all the way up through South and, and, and Central America uh, and got as far as the Mexican border. And then they met the Comanche and that was the end of uh, that advance. And then now uh, sort of, I suppose, ruled, certainly occupy this vast no man's land that covered nearly quarter of a million square miles of Texas and little, little bits of uh, New Mexico and Colorado and uh, Kansas and Oklahoma. Um, but things have been pretty tough for them. Uh, in the 1830s, the Penateca band numbered about 8,000 men, women, and children. But then with uh, more interaction with uh, the Europeans, boom, smallpox, of course, and, and they were decimated, especially in 1837. So they'd had a pretty hard time by the time Moisbach arrived. Uh, they'd also been uh, confronted by the Texas Rangers, who were on the rise at that stage. These are Americans and, and, and Europeans who were, you know, playing their own games, spurring their horses into action and, and charging at the Comanches. Um, so what we've got is that, um, where are we now? Well, that's the, the Texas Rangers uh, charging into action. Um, that the German camps, it, it was about uh, 70 miles west of Austin, a place called Fredericksburg, um, and they're a pretty interesting group of settlers. They were quite an intellectual group, as I say, with uh, socialist ideals. There had been uh, a lot of them were members of the Darmstadt Society of 40, which is a fraternity of free thinking intellectuals from German universities like Heidelberg and Darmstadt. Uh, they had this musician with them who made clarinets and flutes and oboes. Uh, their belongings included several barrels of whiskey 
uh, and a lot of dogs, including uh, one called Moro, who was three foot high and was their sort of mascot dog. Um, so about a year after the colony is up and running, uh, the colonists learn that there's an, uh, about 40,000 uh, indigenous Indians in the neighborhood, probably Comanche, um, including the Penateca, and they're encamped just up the river from where they were. Um, and that gave them, understandably, a degree of uh, indigestion. But Moisbach, uh, who is the leader of them, this remarkable guy, he figured that the only sensible way forward was to head to the camp and go talk to the Comanche. So he did. He brought a small group with him. He walked up to their camp unarmed, uh, and they let him in. They let him pitch uh, a wigwam, uh, and then they sent word off to um, Buffalo Hump, who was their leader, to come and chat. And he and uh, Moisbach uh, uh, and the elders, they had a, a, a chat. They had an amazing chat. They discussed all sorts of things, and they became quite good friends. And they called Moisbach El Sol Colorado, or the, the Red Sun. Uh, which was no small honor given that the sun, you know, represented the great spirit, the premier god of the Comanche. Um, the picture you're looking at now, I'm sorry, it's a bit blurry, but it's based on a painting by Moisbach's uh, daughter. It looks a bit like it's Vincent van Gogh or Vincent van Gogh uh, sitting in the middle of a, of a peace council there with uh, three chiefs and 17 other headmen all seated on buffalo skins spread out in a, a wide circle around that campfire. Um, and look, this wasn't the first time that the Comanche had sat down to talk with Europeans, but this one does stand out on several accounts. And that's why I just wanted to kick off uh, with this story, uh, not least because of what Moisbach had to say. Uh, his speech was translated by one of the headmen who spoke English. And he told them, you know, that he came from far away from across the great waters, uh, that he and his fellow Germans had joined the Americans, they are our brothers, and we all live now under the same great father, the president. Uh, he told them that his industrious and thrifty countrymen had already built a couple of settlements and they hoped to build a few more. He promised that his men only wished to cultivate a relatively small amount of land to grow corn, and he assured them uh, that the Germans had very little interest in hunting uh, the buffalo, which was one of the Comanche's greatest concerns. <clears throat> then he suggests the end game for both sides. He says they should abandon the war path, abandon the war path, and he invited the Comanche to visit our people, our villages, our wigwams. When we are friends, we shall always share our meals with you whenever you come to us. When my people have lived with you for some time, and when we know each other better, then it may happen that some wish to marry. Soon our warriors will learn your language. If they, then to wish, if they then wish to wed a girl of your tribe, I do not see any obstacle and our people will be so much better friends. I do not disdain my red brethren because their skin is darker and I do not think more of the white people because their complexion is lighter. Um, now, Moisbach, he had plenty enough problems with uh, some of his own German colonists, but, uh, and there's, you know, there's a little more to it than that, but it's heartening stuff nonetheless. Uh, and when he'd finished, um, they lit a, a pipe of peace, each man puffed for a while, and then they agreed to convene when the disk of the moon has rounded twice, so in a couple of full moons time. And if you fast forward to the 9th of May, 1847, uh, and Moisbach and the Comanche, they signed this treaty in Fredericksburg and it transpired to be one of wretchedly few cases in American history where immigrants and indigenous people agreed to share land and protect one another. Uh, and it was also that exceptionally rare thing, an unbroken peace treaty with a native tribe. Um, needless to say, the Comanche didn't fare as well as the Germans in the long run. Um, but today there are more than 3 million Texans who consider themselves at least part German, uh, and I know an awful lot of them uh, descend from that, uh, that time. So look, that's, a, that's a, a Texan story. We've got another Texan story coming up in a moment, but uh, the, uh, this is um, a, a wonderful sculpture in Middleton and County Cork made by a guy called Alex Pentec. Um, and in a few weeks, a couple of 10 days time, uh, the story of Europeans and indigenous people working together, uh, I'll be coming back to that with a, with a talk which Bob Manson's also part of with Harvard 
uh, to commemorate this moment, which was also happening at the same time that Frederick Douglass was uh, uh, in Ireland or in, as he was about to leave uh, to head back to America, this incredible gift by the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma in March 1847, when the chiefs of the Choctaw Nation, uh, they subscribed uh, $170 for the relief of the starving poor of Ireland. There's been quite a lot of um, talk about it in the last year for various reasons. I'm not gonna talk in any uh, depth about it today, uh, save that the fund that uh, was set up uh, by the same Quakers who brought uh, Frederick Douglass to Ireland, including uh, Richard Davis Webb, uh, the Quaker printer who, who Douglass stayed with on Pier Street in Dublin. Uh, so there's a lot of synergies going on there. And it is an extraordinary uh, act of kindness that reinforces um, as Alex Pentek uh, reminded me, what the uh, Irish poet John O'Donoghue described as the intimacy of uh, distance. Um, okay, so uh, Texas, Texas where Common Share Era is, where, the, where that German colony is, um, well, Sam Houston had, uh, had not, uh, a few years before uh, Douglas arrived in these parts, Sam Houston had uh, had a comprehensive victory over the Mexicans in the Battle of San Jacinto, uh, and so it had, Texas had become the Republic of Texas, and then it was absorbed into the United States as the 28th state. But um, Texas, as it happens, was also the setting for uh, one of the biggest events of the 1840s, uh, the Mexican-American War. Uh, I wrote a story about a group called the San Patricios. You can, you can see a memorial that I, I came upon in uh, San Angel in Mexico City, once upon a time, and it, and it just completely stopped me in my tracks because it was uh, uh, for Les, Los Soldados Irlandeses, uh, who were the Irish soldiers, the battalion of St. Patrick's Battalion, the San Patricios, um, who was a, a battalion of largely Irish soldiers who had fought for the Mexican army against the USA, and they'd been executed at this exact spot that I was uh, visiting. And uh, I don't know if you can read the names there, but they have amazing names like, well, Juan Riley was the was the uh, the captain from Connemara, but uh, names like Santiago O'Leary, for instance. Um, anyway, it's a it's a full on uh, spaghetti Western epic. But the war itself was um, fascinating uh, and utterly horrific. Uh, and like most conflicts, it was territorial. Uh, in this case, it was caused by the dream of American expansion. Uh, fulfilling manifest destiny. Uh, and we had a, a very uh, aggressive White House under President Polk who sought to basically to push west and get to the Pacific. Uh, Polk, uh, he was uh, elected in the spring of 1844. Uh, James Polk, he was a Democrat. He had Scots-Irish uh, roots, Presbyterian background. Uh, he was a protege of uh, the former president, Andrew Old Hickory Jackson. Um, and at 49, he was the youngest president to have, uh, to have assumed office, although he aged pretty quickly uh, under the pressure of the job. Um, he was pretty eager to cash in on growing trade opportunities with Asia at this time. So, uh, you know, obviously that prospect would uh, be uh, much improved if the US could take ownership of, say, San Francisco Bay and indeed the coast of California. So he tried to buy it from Mexico, but their government was kind of in tatters at the time and his offer wasn't a great one. Uh, so they turned it down. Uh, and instead, Polk dispatches an army of observation uh, south to Texas under the command of Brigadier General Zachary Taylor, a uh, future president. Um, you may recall uh, Frederick Douglass's joyous words from New Year's Day, 1846. When he said, I seem to have undergone a transformation. I live a new life. Instead of the bright blue sky of America, I am covered with the soft gray fog of the Emerald Isle. I breathe and lo, the chattel becomes a man. Well, as I say, New Year's Day, 1846. Unfortunately, things weren't so uh, positive in Mexico on that same day, because by now there was about three and a half thousand uh, US soldiers camped along the Mexican border and war was now inevitable. Uh, the trigger uh, clicked in uh, the 25th of April, 1846, which is around the same time as Douglas was in Scotland, just to put some perspective on that. Um, and this US patrol goes into disputed territory 
and it's ambushed apparently, allegedly by a uh, Mexican cavalry force um, not far from Fort Texas. Uh, and 11 US Dragoons are killed and others are wounded and a lot more are captured. Uh, and President Polk goes, right, this is the moment. Uh, he delivers a big speech to uh, Congress and Congress formally declares war on Mexico. Uh, grants a, a lot of money to uh, raise 50,000 troops uh, and to transport all the sort of military hardware, the latest military hardware down to the Mexican border uh, and across into Mexico. Uh, and it's the first uh, invasion of another country by the United States. Uh, and over the next two years, the Mexicans were beaten into submission. They are annihilated in uh, seven out of seven major battles and a lot of uh, smaller ones too. Uh, and it culminated in, oh, there's a, an example, one of the, the big battles, the Buena Vista. Um, it culminated in the occupation of Mexico City and a treaty by which the US effectively seized control or seized Texas, whatever was disputed in Texas, as well as California, New Mexico, and huge chunks of Wyoming, uh, Arizona, and Utah. So Mexico was down uh, about 2.5 million, uh, sorry, uh, kilometer, million kilometers squared, uh, or 55% of its uh, na uh, national territory. Um, so, you know, the legacy of that, of course, it continues today with Mr. Trump and his proposed wall that didn't happen. Um, but in uh, 1847, what it meant was that Polk had expanded the United States by over a third, and he'd extended it coast to coast, thus fulfilling the manifest destiny, uh, right on the eve of the California gold rush. Um, so you can see uh you can see from there the, the uh, that map shows you roughly what they got in 1848 also um polk's administration had outsmarted the british uh and you can see from the 1846 for 1846 oregon treaty uh that they'd also taken control of washington oregon and idaho so now <clears throat> while the americans are pushing west uh, others are pushing east the french for instance had been sniffing around Vietnam since the 1780s. Uh, and in 1841, uh, this, the gentleman you're looking at on the left, uh, known as Chu Tri, uh, succeeded as emperor of Vietnam. Um, he was a highly educated, extremely intelligent uh, man who ruled in uh, accordance with his Confucian uh, beliefs. He was very strict, very devout to uh, Buddhism and very anti-French. Uh, Vietnam had uh, been playing the isolationist card for quite a long time and he sought to deepen those isolationist policies but he really wanted to bring an end to uh, French interest in the area um, and he's particularly anti-French missionaries uh, so he ordered the arrest of all French missionaries uh, within the empire uh, in 1843 and it kind of backfired uh, because the French government sent a fleet of ships to Vietnam, not, not because they cared particularly about the missionaries, but because they just wanted to increase their presence in the region. And they were also trying to uh, make inroads with Vietnam's uh, northern neighbor, China. Um, but what this uh, event also strangely leads to in uh, 1845, so the same year that Douglas is uh, arriving, is the first uh, military involvement of the United States in Vietnam. And it's an American warship under the command of a guy called Mad Jack Percival. Um, and that is you know, in, in alliance with the French. And basically it attempts to liberate one of those uh, French missionaries who'd been captured and condemned to death. And in May, 1845, Mad Jack uh, led a group of 80 armed US soldiers uh, ashore at, uh, well, it was called Tehran then, but it's Da Nang. We, you probably know it as Da Nang. And they uh, took three mandarins, three senior officials hostage, and they captured uh, three of the emperor's junks. And uh, he put his warship uh, right within firing range of uh, Vietnam's coastal forts. Um, and it's, it's quite hard to find out what actually happened next. Uh, some accounts say the person will return the hostages and set sail. But another report that uh, I, I think... Uh, it's probably more credible, it says that the Americans shot at least 17 people dead and did quite a lot of damage there. Anyway, 
Um, less than two years after that, uh, a couple of French warships arrived back at that port at Da Nang, uh, or Touraine as it was, uh, and they shelled the city for an hour and they left it in ruins. And, and uh, our friend uh, Emperor Chu Tri was, was dead uh, not long after that, I think four or five months later, apparently from smallpox. Um, and the French just kept the pressure on, right? And in 1865, uh, Chu Tri's son, who's the new emperor, uh, was forced to cede control of a, a number of provinces of Vietnam and ports to France. Cambodia also became a French protectorate shortly after this. And then, you know, France is now the, the foremost colonial power in Southeast Asia. 1887, it, uh, it merges Vietnam and Cambodia. Uh, and a few years later, it gets Laos and it continues to you know, be the dominant there until uh, the end of the first Indochina war in 1954. So, you know, a little legacy of what's going on in Southeast Asia. Um, up the way, uh, we see a similar, well, we see similar situations of land grabs kicking off in Africa and elsewhere in Asia. Of course, the British were, were big in India, but China was also in their sights and uh, China was uh, reeling from the British victory in the first opium war that uh, finished up in 1841. <clears throat> um, it's a pretty grim war as wars go and Basically, the Qing dynasty who were ruling China were trying to halt this massive drug epidemic, which uh, British and American and other European merchants had uh, foisted on them, uh, by which about 12 million uh, Chinese were apparently hooked on opium uh, by 1838, 18, 1839, and they were uh, imbibing upwards of 30,000 chests of opium every year and making a lot of money for uh, a lot of those uh, merchants. So the Qing, the, the, the Qing dynasty had sent its army and its uh, navy into action. They've been completely outfoxed and trounced uh, in 1842 by the British uh, under the command uh, of uh, a Limerick born general, Sir Hugh Gough. Um, and the Chinese emperor was forced to concede to uh, a, a very humiliating treaty, the Treaty of Nanking, the first of the infamous unequal treaties uh, by which China was compelled to open up five ports to Western traders. They had to compensate the opium traders for all this uh, losses that they'd suffered earlier. They had to pay Britain a whack of cash and they agreed to make Hong Kong uh, a British crown colony. That was an arrangement that uh, lasted until 1997. I lived in Hong Kong when, uh, when that came to an end as it happened. Um, so the Qing uh, government were pretty unpopular anyway. They were dizzy with shock at the end of all this uh, and rebellions erupted across the empire. The American traders felt a, a little bit guilty about it all for a while. Uh, and they briefly withdrew from opium trafficking to focus on grain and silk. Uh, in January 1845, the president of the United States, this is just before Polk, John Tyler, um, he signed a treaty with China by which the US agreed to cease opium trafficking in return for various rights, including uh, that uh, all important most favored nation status, which uh, basically guaranteed the US the same commercial terms that Britain and, and some, of, some of the other great powers enjoyed with China. Uh, I mentioned John Tyler, incidentally, the president. Um, uh, he was born in 1790. And this might make you twist in your chair a little, uh, but President Tyler, his grandson, his grandson, Harrison Rufflin Tyler, is alive and well and living in Virginia at this very moment in time. Okay, now I mentioned that uh, the American traders, you know, that they were a little uh, unsure about the, the whole opium thing. Uh, but they realized that their, their profits were, were very much dependent on opium, and they actually continued to operate uh, four opium ships on the Chinese coast through the 1850s. The biggest trader of that time was, um, oh, sorry, there's the, the, a scene from the, from the Opium War. Um, the biggest trader from that time was this guy, Robert Bennett Forbes, known as Black Ben. Uh, and he was a Boston merchant. His family had been trading opium to the Chinese since the 1820s. They traded lots of things, but opium was one of them, was the big money earner. Uh, and he, uh, I mean, as I say, he was one of the guys who was pushing for um, grain and silk instead of opium towards the end. Um, and actually in the, uh, in the 1844, um, 
there's a new thing came on the on the market as it were uh ice ice frozen goods uh and the whole notion of that and he loved it he got very excited by ice and uh in 1844 he skippered the first clipper that would bring american ice into china now we're going to fast forward to january 1847 uh fanway hall i hope i'm saying that name right i always get that wrong um in boston um 5,000 of Boston's most affluent citizens have gathered in there and they're discussing the situation in Ireland uh, because Ireland is starting to go, you know, really, really bad. Uh, and in Boston, they're feeling it. The Irish born population uh, actually already numbered 30,000 people at the start of 1847. Uh, a lot of them were new arrivals. A lot of them were living in the uh, disease riddled rookeries all along the Boston waterfront. Uh, where, uh, just to give you an idea of this, between 1841 and 1845, 61% of children under the age of five died, um, generally of smallpox, and tuberculosis, cholera. Um, and as one Boston writer observed, the children of some Irish neighborhoods seem literally born to die. <clears throat> so there was a a tremendous outpouring of emotion in Boston uh, and Black Ben Forbes, who was at that meeting in Fanway Hall, he hatched a plan and his plan was to borrow a warship from the US Navy, stuff it with food supplies and make haste for Ireland. Um, and within four days, he had sent a petition to Congress uh, requesting the use of the USS Jamestown. That's the ship you're looking at now. It was a warship that was lying idle uh, in Boston. Um, and uh, he offered to command the ship uh, without recompense. He didn't want any money. He said he'd recruit all the officers and crew and that he would stuff it with food supplies and personally sail it to Ireland. And he did, this is what he did in April, 1847. Uh, just after Douglas set sail for home, in fact, the two ships might have even, they're both in the Atlantic Ocean at the same time. It's extraordinary to think, isn't it? These ships uh, literally crossing by night. Um, uh, Jamestown with, uh, Ro uh, with um, Blackburn Forbes in charge arrived into Cove in April with 800 tons of food supplies and 16 barrels of clothing. Um, and uh, Forbes, he wrote a fabulous little memoir that's on the, you can find it online quite easily, uh, of his time in Ireland. And uh, he's, he's got a great sense of humor. And he talks about when he arrived and he was met by the Cove Temperance Band, um, which spent the entire day on board the Jamestown uh, playing music to Black Ben and his crew. As Forbes recalled, among the tunes performed, Yankee Doodle and Lucy Long being prominent. And from the frequency of the former, I conclude the Irish consider it our only national anthem. Um, he then embarked on a grand tour of um, County Cork, of you know, famine ravaged County Cork, with no less a guide than Father Theobald Matthew, the uh, apostle of temperance, uh, who had, of course, gave the pledge to Frederick Douglass. So you see all these uh, strange loops we get. Um, anyway, it was obviously it was a pretty unpleasant experience going on a tour as, as uh, Forbes said, I saw enough in five minutes to horrify me. Hovels crowded with the sick and dying, without floors, without furniture, and with patches of dirty straw covered with still dirtier shreds and patches of humanity. Um, you know, similar sights to what Frederick uh, Douglass had, had seen. Uh, I'm not sure if Douglas uh, shared Black Ben's verdict on the women of Cork. Uh, he, uh, uh, Forbes remarking on the agreeable subject of the ladies uh, in his memoir. He said, the ladies uh, being nearly all presented to me, I can vouch for the fact that the ladies of Cork do shake hands like men. Uh, it was no formal touching of the tip ends of their fingers, chilling the heart, but a regular grip of feeling. Uh, and he liked the cork ladies so much that uh, he gave them a lot of gingerbread as a parting gift with a little sprinkling of champagne. Okay, there we go. Um, that is the James. Oh, that's, oh yeah. 
that's a sign of how small the world was in 1840s. And so it's not so surprising that Father Theobald Matthew, who Douglas had met, should then befriend this Boston opium merchant who sails a warship stuffed with relief supplies into Cork Harbor. The world is much more fluid then uh, than we thought. Again, uh, Douglas sailed home to the US from Europe in the same paddle steamer he'd arrived on, but the same ship that this young man had sailed in a couple of months earlier. Um, you might have seen the greatest showman uh, about P.T. Barnum, the legendary showman and his uh, two foot tall accomplice uh, from Connecticut, General Tom Thumb, his cousin, perhaps. Um, they had actually just, I just wanted to sort of uh, have a few words about the sort of things that people were watching in 1845, 1846, 1847. What were the, who were the celebrities? Who were, they, who were the entertainers at that time? Well, this guy, he had performed before five million people during a tour in Europe, including Queen Victoria, the, the King of the French, uh, uh, the Tsar of Russia. Uh, it made him far more successful than any of the touring celebrities of his day. That includes Charles Dickens and uh, Jenny Lind. Um, anyway, he, uh, as I say, came back on the Cambria, the same ship that Frederick Douglass had traveled on. Um, there was a fundraiser actually on the, on the ship during that journey to aid the suffering of the poor in Ireland. And, uh, let the records show that General Tom Thumb, his name headed that list, and he subscribed uh, the equivalent of about 8,000 uh, euros in today's money. Um, another of the great, uh, uh, Tom Thumb had graced a place called Astley's Amphitheatre in London, and another of the great stores at Astley's was 35-year-old Pablo Fanquay, uh, an equestrian entertainer whose story is all the more unusual because he was a black man operating in a very white world in England in the 1840s. And yet for all the press that Pablo Fanque received over the decades, this, I mean, I've looked at all the newspapers, there's very little reference to his uh, ancestry, save uh, the occasional comment that he was a man of color, a colored gentleman, an artiste of color. He was born, um, in St. Andrew's Workhouse in Norwich uh, in England in 1810 and christened William Darby. Uh, his father was allegedly brought direct to uh, Norwich from Africa uh, to work as a servant and then later rose to become a butler. Um, and uh, he married a white woman and, and Pablo or, or William was one of his five children. Uh, maybe through um, his father's employer, Pablo learnt to ride and he learned how to ride very, very well. He, he uh, made his first known appearance in a, in a Norwich sawdust ring in 1821 by performing equestrian stunts and rope walks. And over the next 20, 30 years, he perfected his skills uh, on horseback and he built up a reputation as a, as a tightrope walker as well of, of considerable balance. And he was so good that his um, circus company actually enjoyed a, a 12 night run at Astley's Amphitheatre, uh, as I said, the, the place to be in London at that time. And Queen Victoria was one of the guests. Um, about 120 years later, John Lennon walked into an antique shop uh, and spotted a poster for one of Pablo's circus extravaganzas being held for the benefit of Mr. Kite. And uh, if you can see uh, where uh, John Lennon is pointing on that uh, poster, you will see that he has uh, got it uh, angled at Mr. The, the Hendersons. That was the, the wire walkers, John and Agnes Henderson. And that would of course become uh, a famous Beatles song for the benefit of Mr. Kite. There will be a show tonight on trampoline. The Hendersons will all be there, late of Pablo Fanque's fair. Oh, what a scene. Um, and for the record, the horse that danced the waltz, if you know the song, was not called Henry. Uh, Lennon, uh, John Lennon made that bit up and it got him into some trouble as well, I might add, with uh, high command at the BBC. They became uh, very paranoid that Henry the horse was some sort of dark code word for heroin and banned the song. So there you go. Um, Beatlemania uh, we're all familiar with, but in the 1840s, it was list mania was the thing. That was the big list mania. Uh, the Hungarian virtuoso Franz Liszt was wowing the crowds with his piano skills and women were going crazy for him wherever they went. And, and that term list mania was, was coined at that time. Uh, another mania from the 1840s was for this lady, Jenny, Lin uh, Jenny Lind, the Swedish nightingale, uh, another star of the greatest showman. 
Um, she was uh, packing uh, during the 1844, 1845, packing out uh, houses in Germany and Austria. Uh, you know, all the em imperial family of the Austro-Hungarian Empire couldn't get enough of her. Uh, and she, uh, she would, was about to team up with Felix Mendelssohn, the composer, and she was about to uh, conquer well, the United Kingdom and then with P.T. Barnum, the USA. Um, so that's kind of, it's a very roundabout uh, look at some of the things that were going on around the world in 1845 to 1847 when uh, Douglas was in Ireland. You know, we've, we've talked about the Mexican War, that's a, about expansionist ambitions of the, of the United States and land was also the root cause of that French attack on Vietnam. Uh, and indeed, it's uh, at stake in the ambitions of the British Empire. Looking at uh, a map of British India here, land is, you know, what's going on with the mounting tensions that are arising along the northern borders of the Ottoman Empire with uh, the Russian Empire. And that's going to break out into the Crimean War. Uh, you have more cerebral disputes uh, about equality and religion and liberty that are at the heart of the revolutions that are about to erupt uh, throughout Europe in 1848. Uh, even the Swiss are gonna be plunged into a civil war, uh, although they felt so guilty about uh, having a civil war with the Swiss that they basically invented the Red Cross. Um, I could have uh, talked about some of the other characters from this, from this time, Lola Montes of County Sligo, um, you can, she's, uh, she's just behind me here as I, as I, as I speak to you. She was uh, seducing uh, men like Franz Liszt as it happened and became mistress to the King of Bavaria uh, just uh, in 1846 um, and, and actually ended up causing a revolution in, in Bavaria and the abdication of the King. So uh, that's a, a powerful Sligo woman. Uh, we could have talked about the Mormons marching uh, across America. And, you know, I've obviously, I've not uh, focused uh, on the big one, the great hunger uh, because I know this has been covered elsewhere during uh, Douglas week, but uh, you know it's something we're still getting to grips with nearly 175 years later. What happened in Ireland, it caused such a massive shadow across the world, um, and those facts never uh, fail to horrify. To give you uh, an example, in 1847 alone, uh, nearly 400,000 men, women, and children are said to have died of starvation and fever. Uh, another quarter of a million uh, fled uh, primarily to the UK and Canada, and you get a, a, a massive knock-on effect from that. In Toronto, take uh, Toronto, the population trebled to sixty thousand over the course of eighteen uh, of over the course of eighteen forty-seven, and the vast bulk of those newcomers are coming from Ireland. Uh, there were amazing moments. We've talked about the shock tall gift. We've talked about Blackburn Forbes bringing the Jamestown in. Uh, another guy here, Rodney Baxter, extraordinary grizzled sea dog from Cape Cod. Uh, he lugged a cargo of flour and corn across the seas uh, from Barnstable uh, in, in 22 days in a schooner, him and some buddies. They just went little sort of private mercy missions. Uh, another one was the, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Sultan uh, Abdulmajid, who contributed uh, 1,200 pounds to the relief uh, of the, of well, of the distress uh, and he's also credited with sending uh, three Ottoman ships laden with grain uh, to Drogheda uh, that arrived uh, in May 1847, another enduring story to this day. And it, the point is, uh, you know, these stories, they, as I say, it's not that long ago um, that all these events were happening, uh, but hopefully that's given you a little context uh, about, um, you know, what it was like back then. And now I'm going to pass over to uh, Bob Manson. Bob, take it away. I will. There is there is a, a map of the world to uh, end on. Sorry, there is a uh, a map of the world to end on. Over to you, Bob. Thanks, Turtle. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, that has been absolutely fascinating. It is amazing um, <clears throat> to think about um, just how recent all of those things are. I, I can't imagine that Michael Caine is going to thank you uh, <laughs> <laughs> for, that, for, that, for that reference at the beginning. 
Uh, I, I was doing my own, um, you know, thinking about the historical context of uh, the subject matter of your talk today and just how recent things are, in fact. And one of the, the, the interesting things that came up um, was I, I, I noticed that, you know, of all the things that were going on in 1845, I, I came across this matter of historical fact, which was that uh, two gentlemen, H.L. Fizeau and Léon Foucault, take the first photo of the sun in 1845, right? Mm -hmm. And then it got me thinking about, okay, so if that, if that happened in 1845, um, Voyager 1, uh, uh, Voyager 1, which was launched in 1977, is the furthest man-made object uh, in space from the Earth, obviously. Right. Um, at, at a distance of 22.8 billion kilometers, which is an unfathomable, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to get that, that just idea into your head of just how far that is. Yeah. Um, but I think what it says is that um, these things are, you know, are, are, are so recent. Our own president, who I think turns 80 at his next birthday, uh, has talked about in the past, he's from the West of Ireland, uh, his grandparents were alive during the famine. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, it, same with the, with the Vanishing Ireland project that you mentioned earlier. A lot of the people I've, I've interviewed over the last 20 years, um, yeah, their grandparents were alive at the famine. I mean, a, a lot of people alive today, their grandparents were alive uh, during those times, um, which is, it's a bit of a head fry to get your head around it, um, but it does, uh, there's no better way to show how close we are to those times, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just uh, going to pick up a couple of comments here that have been put up in the chat. So one, th there's a comment from Stephen that says uh, he can also recommend the Irish History podcast for uh, features on Lola Montez, among others. The coverage of the famine on that show is really good, too. Uh, there is a question also about uh, you referenced The Greatest Showman. It's come under criticism for its cultural appropriation and celebration of a slave owner. And yet its message is one of inclusion. Um, and the question is, if you can reflect upon this in relation to the history. Um, well, <laughs> P.T. Barnum is, uh, is uh, I think he comes under criticism for a lot of his different uh, activities. So um, uh, yeah, I, I certainly, uh, I think it was a, a big question mark over his treatment of elephants also. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know uh, about his um, being a slave owner. It doesn't uh, su surprise me particularly. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think he was. That's what he did, wasn't it? He kind of uh, exploited um, exploited people. But weirdly, when you uh, study the story of him and General Tom Thumb, um, that uh, I, I assumed that he was exploiting that poor young man as well. But actually, they were tremendous uh, friends all the way through, and. Uh, Tom Thumb, General Tom Thumb, bailed him out a couple of times in later life, and they're buried uh, very close to each other in the same cemetery. Um, so he had he had redeeming features, uh, no doubt. Um, that's that's all I can really say. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just to, to to quickly mention, there's another question here, which I know you touched on briefly. Uh, you showed us Alex Pentex's majestic uh, sculpture in Middleton, uh, the Kindred Spirits Monument, and there is a question in the. Um, uh, in the chat about, uh, you know, maybe you could expand a little on the Irish Native American links. I will say we're heading towards the top of the hour. So I know there's not a huge amount of time. Um, you, you uh, just to cover this, uh, you are gonna be doing a talk with the Harvard group about the, um, uh, those links between the Choctaw, the Choctaw gift and the, this kind of, giving circle that that was initiated by the Choctaw gift. Um, I'm wondering, is there a website? Are you, are you going to put that up on your website? Do you think could you direct people to that? Uh, yes, I'm sure we I'm sure I'm sure we could. Um, Car me... Maybe maybe Caroline could put it up on the Douglas Week um, website. We can talk about that afterwards if people wanted to know a little bit more about those links between um, the Irish and the Native American gift. I'm sure that uh, th this event is happening on the 24th of February. 
Yes, and I'm going to just uh, do a, a gentle plug, uh, which I was sort of avoiding. But um, if you if you are interested in these events, I, I, I do talk about uh, all of them in in two books. The one on the left, Hope in 1847, is a Kindle book um, that tells some of the stories I've told today, and then the, the one on the right is a is a, a longer account of all those, which is a, a, in a hardback version, uh, both available uh, reasonably easily, I hope. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just in terms of that that question about the um, the Irish links to um, to the uh, Indigenous Americans. I mean, it is a fascinating story, uh, and um, basically, I will be talking about it in a couple of weeks. But the the reason, or one of the reasons, why the shop tour made that donation, I'm pretty sure, is because of their uh, friendship with these two uh, brothers, the Armstrong brothers. Um, who were the sons of a man from Enniskillen in County Fermanagh, uh, who'd been with them during that uh, awful era of the Trail of Tears, uh, which was in the 1830s, uh, where the shock tour had suffered really, really badly. Uh, and they uh, developed uh, from that an empathy with, with others. Uh, and that really expressed itself most uh, obviously um, during the, the, when they made that donation for the relief of uh, the starving in Ireland. Thanks, uh, thanks, Turtle. I, I think uh, just um, we probably have time just for one more question, which is just uh, so d if, if Frederick Douglass commented on the famine or any other significant moments in Irish history, repeal, etc., after he returned to the U.S., I, I will, I will. Obviously, one of the big things that happened when Frederick Douglass was in Ireland was that he befriended uh, Daniel O'Connell, um, and Daniel O'Connell. Um, it once said that the history of Ireland might be traced like a wounded man uh, through a crowd by the blood. And supposedly Frederick Douglass took this, he was very moved by that uh, image uh, that was conjured up in his mind. And he sort of appropriated that. I mean, he did credit Daniel O'Connell um, with that phrase, but he continued to use that phrase um, in talks that he gave him in uh, Douglass, died uh, in what year did Douglas die um, mm -hmm. in 18 in the 18, 1895 was it I think it was 1895 um, but uh, yeah if you could comment on if if, if Douglas uh, referenced Ireland um, other than the references to Daniel O'Connell after after he left Ireland uh, yes, I mean, yeah, as you say, well, he was he obviously became such good buddies with with um, Daniel O'Connell while they were there. Um, and I think after when um, he learned that Daniel O'Connell died in 1847, another uh, you know monstrously epic event uh, during that year, I think his uh, greatest concern was that um, the, 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 the sort of cause, uh, the big causes in Ireland were now passing to the Young Ireland group. Uh, and he wasn't uh, quite so crazy about uh, them. He uh, particularly um, uh, wasn't keen on John Mitchell, for instance. Um, you know, these were the, the Young Ireland groups, as he um, said. I've just found a quote here. But when he when he learned of Daniel O'Connell's death, Douglas um, lamented uh, that a great champion of freedom has fallen, and the cause of the American slaves, not less than the cause of his country, has met with a great loss. All the more was this felt when I saw the kind of men who came to the front when the voice of O'Connell was no longer heard in Ireland. He was succeeded by the Duffys, Mitchells, Mars, and other men who loved liberty for themselves and their country, but were utterly destitute of sympathy with the cause of liberty in countries other than their own. That's a big statement. Absolutely, absolutely it is. And with that big statement, I think we will um, draw our, our uh, our talk to uh, its conclusion. Turtle, it has been a fascinating hour to see, you know, the, the historical context, uh, what was going on in the world, in the rest of the world, uh, when Frederick Douglass visited these shores. Uh, I know that uh, this is, there's a, a, an awful lot in this. I know that, uh, you know, this is going is, is going to keep going. It's been um, a pleasure for me uh, to be involved in this event and in the wider Douglas Week and uh, look forward to 
uh, collaborating uh, in the future with Caroline and, and everybody involved in this. So I just want to thank you, Turtle, for your time today and uh, all the effort that went into preparing the talk. I'm going to hand back to Kristen Leary now uh, and thank everybody for attending. Thank you. And thank you, Bob, also from me. Much appreciated. Not at all. Thanks very much, Turtle and Bob, that, for a fascinating conversation with a lot packed into just, uh, just under an hour, just over an hour, I should say. Um, thank you, thank you, and, and, and thanks to all of the alumni who turned it, tuned in. Thanks to everyone else for watching. Um, thanks also, especially Turtle, for those fantastic graphics to accompany such an engaging conversation. Um, for, for those who are particularly interested in the process, interested in the process of making those types of um, visual uh, eye candy, we have a great conversation uh, this afternoon at 4 p.m. GMT uh, on the process of painting Frederick Douglass and other iconic figures. Um, we will close out Douglas Week tonight uh, at 8 p.m. GMT with a panel of uh, very inspiring women. And we hope you will join us for those events tonight. Uh, a reminder that all of our events uh, will be posted on our YouTube page and on our webpage, uh, douglasandcork.com in the coming days. And we hope you stay in touch with us throughout Douglas Week, which now has become Douglas Year and perhaps beyond. So we'll see you in 2022 and, 